All right, welcome to today's webinar on uh, Cool Season Vegetable Gardens. I'm just going to pause for a moment while we let everybody start getting logged in. Um, if you guys have any questions as you're getting logged in, please feel free to send me a chat. I am enabling that right now for you all. I always forget to do that. Um, okay, good. I see our numbers starting to go up. All right. Well, an official welcome to today's webinar for anyone who is new today. Uh, welcome. We're glad to have you. Just a quick notice, because I know we've started getting more and more people from across the country, which is very cool, but be aware that this is geared towards zone seven in general. Um, so we're in the Virginia area and we're happy to answer questions. Just be aware if you're farther south or farther north that some of the, uh, you may need to make some adjustments <laughs> to the information that you're getting. Um, Today, Peg is joining us to talk about cool season vegetable gardens. It's hard to believe it's already that time of year. Uh, Peg has extensive experience growing vegetables and herbs in her own garden and, of course, has been an instructor with Maryfield for many years and brings a lot of knowledge. So, um, Peg, I know you really need no introduction, but just for anyone who's new, uh, Peg spends most of her time in the annuals department at our Fair Oaks store, and she does a lot of classes for us, um, instruction, instructional videos. Uh, she's a great source of knowledge for all of us at the Garden Center, as well as for our customers. And she is a previous veteran of our Gardening Advisors TV show back when we had, had that. Um, well, Peg, as always, it's great to have you on, and I will allow you to just take it away. Well, thank you very much, Sally. And today's uh, video is, uh, Zoom, is about vegetables, fall vegetables in particular. And I'm really glad that she mentioned that it is really pertinent to the Mid-Atlantic region. So if you are farther south, you, you're just beginning to get into some of this and some of these things will go through the winter easily. I know having been uh, brought up uh, as a little girl in uh, southern Georgia on a farm, uh, I really know about the winter vegetables down there going through most of the winter. Uh, if you're a little further north, the season is shorter and uh, you really have to... Uh, Think about some of the frost cloth that I'll talk to you about later. I just took a quick walk through our little veggie herb garden here at the Ferrex location and, and from a container picked some rosemary. So in addition to the vegetables, we will certainly talk a little bit about the, the herbs that go with it because I cook a great deal with uh, herbs and oh, they're so wonderfully fragrant. I do have a lot of pictures today, which I'm going to try to get through most of them. I did this presentation last Saturday, and, and it's really sort of a repeat, so I may have a few too many pictures to fit into today, but I, I want to start with the fact that um, we want to involve young people um, in our gardening world, and I certainly have done that with my children, my four children, and uh, my 12 grandchildren, uh, spouses, etc., those that have them. And uh, now my three great-grandchildren, the oldest of which is Clara in this picture. And she's standing in the current uh, vegetable herb um, garden. And actually, I've put this picture in here because she is out with me ready to pick some of the tomatoes and the cucumbers etc and why am I showing you this this is an area that is totally enclosed with deer fencing because I spray with bobex to keep the deer from eating uh hosta and many, many other things that I really do enjoy. But this is an area where I can enclose um, uh, my vegetables and my herbs. And Danny, can you ask them to quit? Excuse me, I'm sorry. We just had somebody that didn't realize we were doing this here. Okay, so with, with Clara, she's standing in the middle of an area that's highly diverse. It has lilies and it has many things that I don't want the deer to eat. But this diversity 
is very good for the vegetable garden also because it, it brings a lot of the pollinators and everything works out really well. Plus the vegetables are somewhat secluded in areas here and there and that confuses uh, the bad guys, I think. So let me just show you a little of the diversity that is enclosed in this space. And it's really a pretty large space. It's one of the few spaces that I actually have a great deal of sunshine. So in that area are the oriental lilies, which deer devour just when you're wanting to see those beautiful blooms. And so I have quite a few in this garden. There are blueberries in this area. There's echinacea in this area. It is a lot of herbs too very diverse and we'll go through these pretty quickly and here's another area where there's strawberries and uh, I have in this case it was early spring and there were violas violas are actually edible they're beautiful to decorate your uh, salads and, and various things with also and in this picture you can see how I have used this was last spring okay how I have used lettuce as an edging to this little small section of the garden. So lettuce is certainly a wonderful plant that you can use within the garden itself as an edging. And it's very attractive because it, there's different, uh, different colors among it, burgundy uh, and so forth. So it's very interesting. Okay, this is another view a little bit later on when the roses are coming into bloom and I can enjoy all of those there and their various iris and other things that the deer might be likely to eat. Okay, here's the lilies. You see how beautiful they are and I absolutely love them, but it is very difficult to, to grow them where you have deer country, believe me. And here I had to share this because it was in bloom. This is absolutely one of my favorite uh, clematis or clematis as you wish. Okay. And we just got a few in this fall. We'll have a lot more next spring. It's a tiny little thing that has bloomed off and on all summer long. And it is, I'm going to spell it. R-O-G-U-C-H-I, Roguchi Clematis, okay. Now, here is what I do with um, the garden when I get ready to plant, and I was out planting plants of my cabbage and broccoli and kale, etc. cetera. Um, my soil is pretty good. I do not till my soil. I don't turn the entire area. I did many years ago to get it started. And I kind of recommend that you turn st stuff thoroughly and turn your um, organic matter into your soil, maybe the first time. After that, you can actually put an inch or two on top and hopefully the worms will take it down and let them do the work for you. Because the more you turn your soil, the more seeds you're bringing up and the more weeds you're likely to have. And so I turned each little area that I planted and I am at the moment very enamored with this coast of Maine. Um, it's byproducts of, of lobster and crab and, and that kind of thing. And I found that things really respond. It is all organic and into the area where I'm planting each plant, I put a shovel full or two of this coast of Maine and work it slightly into the soil. And then I add a good handful of the organic um, garden tone or plant tone. They're almost interchangeable as far as I'm concerned. But we're going to see a little bit more as we go along as my prep work with this. I, I love to get in there without heavy duty tools once I have put that in and mix it really well. And we have those wonderful, you can come back to me just for a second, what I'm kneeling on. I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I, the knees don't really want to be down on that soil all the time. Okay. And sometimes it's moist. I'm hoping for that soon. We need some moisture in the ground, that's for sure. 
But this is a fantastic thing because there's certain products that I like to promote because I just can't garden without them, seemingly. Okay, let's go back to some of the pictures, Danny, and see if we can cover a good bit of them. We'll do the next one, okay? So I did, with getting on my knees with that little tool where I'd already worked in some of that lobster compost, I began to plant and I gave each one of them a little space, maybe a little less than might be recommended. They're probably only a foot apart, but that's going to be just fine. The soil is nice and rich and it'll be okay. So this was uh, the previous early spring when I did them more in rows. At the moment, my tomatoes are still going and my okra is still going, my squash is still going. And so what I did was plant in the spaces that were open and that is just fine. What you're seeing here is just after I planted, I put down some of the Virginia Fines mulch. And in the next picture, this is how I did that afterwards. I put down wherever I can, but never over where you've got bulbs. Because if you do this, the bulbs might not come through next spring, okay? So I put down four or five layers of newspaper. You can also use cardboard if you have access to that, okay? But I put down the newspaper and overlap it so that the, the seeds, weeds can't come through. And then I top it off with the Virginia Fines mulch. And I believe in this picture, this is when I finished up the planting in the spring. After I'd put down the newspaper and put down some mulch, I topped it off with a bit of, of, of pine needles. I absolutely love those pine needles. And it may be my imagination, but I think they also repel some of the slugs. The slugs don't seem to like to crawl around on that pine straw. It's nostalgic for me. Okay, I'm going to tell you about a product that I totally believe in and cannot be without. And, and you can see here where I have used the side pins to pin this down. Let's come back to me, Danny, for just a moment. This, this is a product that my son gave me a large roll-off for Christmas one year, and I'm still using it, okay, because it's very reusable. Uh, this particular brand is Harvest Guard. There's another one or two, but primarily I think what we have is Harvest Guard, okay? Comes in different sizes. Can be used for several purposes. Those that are absolutely totally organic can use this to cover if you do it carefully so the bugs can't get in. Because the one thing that you have a problem with while it's still warm is the little white cabbage, white or slightly yellow butterfly. And it, it sets the little um, worms on this and it really can damage them very quickly. I use, and it's very easy and it is organic, it's a product called Bacillus thuringiensis. Bacillus thuringiensis. And I spray this to keep the worms from eating this. Now, you do not have to worry about it killing other uh, caterpillars because that cabbage moth is specific to these plants, the brassicas, specific to those. The other caterpillars don't get on these plants. And so you're not killing those plants by spraying these. But... I mean, I, you saw how I was pinning that landscape fabric down with what we sell as sod pins. They look like gigantic hairpins, and they're very useful for a lot of purposes. But rain and sun go through this. It's thin, but it's amazing how sturdy it can be. So when you're planting these, if you don't want to, ever, to spray it all, which I prefer, you can loosely put it over these because you want to give it a chance to grow through. And once it gets cold, that's the end of the caterpillars. They won't have those anymore. So what you're doing is protecting it while it's still warm. Okay, what I use this for more than anything else is early frosts in the fall 
And all of these plants will go through and love light frost. If we're into November and there's a heavy frost predicted, that's when I'll reach for this and, and just cover them over and, and they'll just keep going in December possibly. And so this is very valuable. You can also cover any of your containers as long as you give it ample room to go over and tie it down. You can't, sometimes hard to use side pins with that, but you can tie it down with a nice little string. I use it in the spring for um, late frosts. And so it's very, very valuable product to have to use in your garden. Wanted to share that, okay. Let's continue with these slides there. Okay, this is how I pin it down, okay. Now, I have used Clara to help me because she loves helping in the garden. And we have done a container here, which I grow a lot of vegetables in. And I have some growing in right now. And you can grow them in nice big containers. It's great to be able to, to plant a lot of these from seed right now still. Uh, it's better to start the cabbage that you want to head, the broccoli or the Brussels sprouts from plants because it's getting a little late for seed. But she's adding the fertilizer here. So give, give these young people the opportunity to learn how to do some of these things. Okay, you see she's working it, working it into the soil and she has a great understanding of that too. And she's four years old. Okay, lettuce right now in the garden. I actually, in part shade, have had lettuce all summer long. And even as warm as it is right now, my lettuce is still thriving because these leafy vegetables don't require as much sunshine as tomatoes and okra and squash, cucumbers, that sort of thing. And so you can often grow particularly lettuce all summer long in part shade where it's protected from the hottest afternoon sun. And I have had this fresh lettuce all season. And look how attractive it is, you know. You can grow it even in a small garden, a townhouse garden, in containers. Okay, here's other things. You can see another grouping of the dark leaf um, lettuce here. I have lovage growing in the large container. And, and I use that a great deal in the cooking. And beyond that, there's there's um, onion. And you can put onions in right now. It's fantastic. I, I love to use the green parts of the onion as much as I do the base of it. Now, I've already started in some containers. Also, the, the cabbage and the broccoli. I started a couple of weeks ago, and we still have them right now ready to go. But these are in fairly large containers, so they don't dry out so quickly, okay? I minimum is 12 inches, but I prefer 18 and above, okay? Now, I also have a couple of, of low little raised beds that I've started just now some lettuce in, and you can see that some is just beginning to pop up and so you can really keep this lettuce thing going as long as you do it every two or three weeks and it's always fresh and I love it it's so good okay and there she is because when you've helped plant it you also enjoy the harvest and and when she's out in the garden in reality um she, she likes to eat it on the spot. And and uh, and what a pleasure that is. You know, um, come back to me for a second. Okay, that's a we'll come back to this one. Okay. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we had a lot of families in with young children. And we've still continued to have a good many. But I'm not, I don't know if there's quite as many. 
There's one thing that is very, very important with young children, with any children for that matter, maybe, maybe even us adults, and that is success. Most of us like to succeed when we are doing anything, <laughs> especially gardening. And so we need to teach people the basics, that they learn to do these things, and that it's not all just work, but that it's very satisfying. And that it's also a way to have a fresh product locally grown that's grown organically. You don't have to worry about the chemicals. I'm not anti-chemical, but I certainly am very judicious use of chemicals. I use very few of them. In fact, as far as fertilization is concerned, thank you, Dean. It is a little heavier than I thought. <laughs> when I'm working in my soil, I trump wherever possible to use organic fertilizers. Organic and inorganic work well. But we're also taught, particularly in the last few years, I'm not a soil scientist, okay, <clears throat> but I do a lot of reading and try to keep up with all the current things that are going on. And we're told that there's a lot going on in our soil that we're not aware of. And a lot of it is that these root systems are talking to each other. Well, I'd like to believe that, you know? And that when we use chemicals, it might interfere with that conversation. Um, that the organic things are better to work with the soil and the organisms that are in that soil. And so I'm trying to follow along with that thought process. And I like to use organic in that situation. Now, when I'm working with containers, although I stick to the organic with my vegetables, uh, this weekend I'll be doing container gardens, regular uh, fall container gardens for pleasure, okay, not eating. And a lot of times I will use a liquid fertilizer in those because I, I'm not worried about the trees talking to each other, okay? Now, all right, so a good fertilizer is required by most things, okay? As far as overall things with my azaleas and so forth, they make a great product for that too. I use, and I think the next slide coming up, uh, we'll find out if it's next, okay? Well, let's, let's go through these and I'll come back to this in just a moment, okay? Uh, lucky enough, uh, you know, I think it's been two falls ago now, time passes so quickly, that this was the White House garden, okay? Uh, started in the Obama uh, situation and going through until now. They, they're still taking good care of it. And you can see a lot of the fall crops coming on. There's onions, there's uh, various types of, of uh, leafy vegetables in here, and it was beautifully taken care of, and it was a real pleasure to get to see that. Okay, what I didn't mention is within that vegetable garden of mine, I also have figs. Great time to get some in the ground if people are harvesting their figs now. But the slide that I was wanting to get to is the next one. And that's, we're talking about soils and what do we use to improve our soils. I have a large area by comparison for this space, okay? And I do unfortunately have deer, although it's in a heavily populated area. I'm not a lover of Bambi, okay? I just am not because it was years after we bought our place there before I ever saw a deer in the area. And now they're frequent and, and, and a high population. They have no, the, the automobile is their only adversary, okay? And so we have to battle that all the time. But I do have a lot of leaves. I have a lot of oak trees. And I don't have them hauled away. I make compost with them. I do not take my kitchen scraps or anything out because, number one, it's a fair distance out there. 
So it's only composed of the leaves and straw for aeration. And in the summertime when I have it, I work all the grass clippings into this compost. I try to get some help, wonderful grandsons that pitch in with this now and then, and turn that pile three or four times during the summer, and that's it. Um, and so it's a slow composting thing. And then in the fall, before I'm ready to bring more leaves into this, it's not thoroughly rotted down, but it works beautifully. I can then take this and put in a lot of my flower beds and around the azaleas because they all love that. And what happens? As it's continuing to break down and over the, the winter it does, it's worked into the soil by the earthworms that I have because it's a healthy soil, okay? And this is sometimes the only fertilization that they need, okay? Now, in a small space, I highly recommend the bagged leaf grow that we sell. And putting it down two or three inches is fine. And then if you don't like the look of that, you can top it off with the Virginia Fines mulch. And that, again, is sometimes the only amount of fertilizer that those established plants actually need, okay? Although, certainly there are plenty of organic things that can be used, okay? Now, to sort of, I believe, that must be the last one. Is that the last one? No, I've got the herbs in here. Okay, can't, can't pass up the herbs. And, and I grow a lot of these because I don't have a great deal of sign. I'm getting more, unfortunately, because I've lost a couple of oak trees. Um, I have a lot of herbs in containers um, near my back door. Now, at the moment, because it's been hot, I have saucers under these pots. No, it doesn't attract mosquitoes because believe me, as warm as it's been, all that water is absorbed before any mosquito has a chance to lay anything in it, okay? So I'm not worried about these saucers collecting water and standing for <coughs> mosquitoes into them, okay? And I thoroughly soak. I think people don't understand a lot of people don't understand how to water when you are planting it doesn't matter what it is if you're planting you want to thoroughly thoroughly soak that plant so that the root ball and the soil surrounding it is thoroughly soaked right now we really need some rain in my immediate area anyway i'm very very dry and i have done some planting recently and I definitely, definitely have soaked it well. You don't want to go out there and do that every day necessarily, but you want to check often, whether it's in the ground or in a container, you want to literally feel that soil and determine, whoo, does this need some water? Don't wait until it goes bone dry. Let it just be slightly moist, maybe, and then thoroughly, thoroughly water it again. I don't have an irrigation system. And sometimes you really have to worry about irrigation systems. I know I had a neighbor who watered a dogwood in the center of his lawn, and he had an irrigation system, but it kept that dogwood from getting established. And I tried to explain that it was keeping a root ball too wet before it had the opportunity to establish a root system. And so then he planted another dogwood off to the side where it wasn't hit by that sprinkler and it thrived, okay, because he was watching the watering of it and not depending upon the sprinkler system to overwater or in some cases underwater. So you have to watch sprinkler systems, okay? And if you're standing out there with a hose, you'd be surprised how long it takes to, this is more than a 12, this is probably 18 inches in, in diameter and depth 
It takes several minutes to thoroughly soak that entire rhubarb, okay? And in the heat that we've had recently, it's almost a daily thing with these really large containers. For me, it's been every other day, even as warm as it is. Now back to those saucers. This is a gentle reminder. Those saucers are fantastic for holding water to be absorbed when it's wet. You must remove those saucers before freezing weather, before winter. Take it out while it's still pleasant and it's cool and store those saucers elsewhere. And if you're growing in containers, particularly with the ceramic or the terracotta, which is wintered pretty well for me, um, you don't want to ever leave them sitting directly on soil. You want to raise them with pot feet, with brick, or with something. In this case, I've got some attractive old rusted uh, metal that I sit some of them on, okay? But not all. The others are resting either on uh, a tile or pot feet, okay? So enough with that, with the saucers thing. So that's just for future reference, okay? Are there any more of these? Um, I think that's the last one. Okay, so we'll move on from, from that, okay? We have these wonderful plants here. And it's a good time to get them started as soon as possible, okay? And even if it's warm outside, as long as you properly plant them and properly water them, watering them well you, when you put them in and then checking them daily as long as it stays really warm. We also have something that I, <laughs> I have to chuckle when I see these come in and they're called bunching onions. And they definitely are because when you plant these, they develop a lot of little shoots and little bulbs. And, and I remember at my mother loved these when I was a small child. And the one job that I did not like was trying to clean all those little tiny bunching onions. Well, they're wonderful to use if you've got the patience. And I didn't then, but I do now, okay. But what I use my onions for, even the little onion sets, is not to grow big onions. I've really never done that. I use the greens as much as I do the root. I love the fresh greens in a stir frying and in, in soups and in all of that. So you can go ahead and do that. Kale, I don't know how many of you enjoy or eat kale, but there's several different varieties and they have slightly different flavors. And I do enjoy them and they're very healthy for you. And they grow, these plants, unless we have really, really heavy freeze, will go well through November, okay? And, and sometimes beyond, everything depends upon the weather. Now we have um, little six packs of violas, and I do love the violas in the containers or in the ground too. They're wonderful uh, in the garden, and, and they're wonderful to pick and, as I said, decorate. You can actually eat them. I, I don't, you know, but you can decorate with them, and they're very attractive. But they look very pretty and very inviting with all the other things, and we have pansies and that sort of thing too. Okay, now... A oh, number of selections, thank goodness it's a good selection downstairs, of the various greens from seeds. And certainly from seeds, you can still have some success with those things that don't head particularly. For the cauliflower, the broccoli, the cabbage, uh, the Brussels sprouts, you need to buy the plants to go ahead and get those going because they take longer to form. But these things are wonderful. Now, I use a lot of parsley also. And the parsley is something that's a biennial. It grows in one season and you use it and then the next year it will go to seed. You can use it until it goes to seed. And a lot of times when it does that, the blossoms are really very attractive and good for the pollinators also. But if you've got the space, 
And here's another one that is good as a border. If you've got a really small garden, it is the parsley, okay? But it's, it's a little slower to germinate than some of the others. If you plant the lettuce and these other plants, the mustard greens, the kale, the collards, they come pretty quickly. You'd be surprised, you know, but the parsley will take a few more days to, to germinate, okay? Now, another thing when I go out that I'd like to share with you is, uh, I'm a mosquito magnet. I don't understand why in earlier years, my husband just didn't attract mosquitoes. But I was a gardener, and I do. And, and we're still learning more and more about that. But there are a couple of ways that I deal with this. And if any of you have any other brilliant ideas, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, I have developed for several years now what I call mosquito traps. I have some attractive containers, although in some areas they're not attractive, okay? But in certain areas they are. Things that hold water. And the mosquitoes are attracted to the water to lay their eggs. And, and you can watch thousands of them. When you see that, I treat on hand these mosquito bits all the time. And I will set these traps and it's going to be a week before they're visible, okay? So I'm sure that, that within that week, I get some mosquito bits according to the directions and the size of the container, into the water. Because it kills yes. those mosquitoes' larvae almost immediately. It doesn't, it's organic. It does not hurt the birds. It doesn't hurt anything else. So I don't want you to drink it. But it doesn't, it only kills those mosquitoes, okay? So I rely upon these mosquito bits to help. And I have enough of them that it I think it definitely makes a difference. When you can see these thousands in a container that I have like this big, and then drop these things in, and then they're gone within an hour anyway, uh, you realize how many you killed, you know? Now, I can't kill them all, and neither can you with that method. It helps. I do, and the one thing that is really dependable is uh, DEET. And I don't like DEET on my skin. I don't want to be eaten by the mosquitoes, so I never go out for any period of time in the garden, except with long pants and often long sleeves and a hat. And I spray the pants, I spray the socks, I spray a bit on the shirt and on the hat. I don't want it on my skin, but it does a good job at repelling the mosquitoes. Now, there are a lot of other uh, organic things that can be used for that also. Unfortunately, I've developed a slight allergy, and it's more than slight to a couple of them. Uh, of, of, of a couple of the things that is used. Now, my daughter even sells doTERRA, which has a, a wonderful blend and is very effective on small children. So there are definitely organic things out there, which you just need to try to see what works for you. And those you can't be afraid of putting on the, the skin because unless you are allergic to that particular one, and I happened to be allergic to one or two of the things that were in the blend, and that's why I couldn't use that particular product. And some of the other organic products just haven't had any effect where I'm concerned, but I have relied on this. Now, if any of you have any better ideas, I'd love to hear it because it's very annoying to go out and, and, and be bitten by the wind. Plus, it's not safe. And the deer ticks. You know, that, that's another problem, too, that, that we as gardeners have to live with. Uh, predominantly in a wooded area where it's just what I have, okay? And I certainly don't want to give up that wooded area already. Uh, as far as the deer are concerned, I use a product 
called Bobex, um, a lot of things, but you absolutely, and if you cannot use it um, on your vegetables and the things that you're going to eat, it's an organic thing. But if the deer don't want to eat it, um, neither do you. And so this is why I have, I, I want to guess that it's 150 feet one way. It may be 200 by at least 60 feet that is fenced with a sturdy uh, deer fencing, which Maryfield Garden Center does. And, and they did mine. And it has kept the deer from getting in. It's tall enough that they don't jump over and knock on some wood. And, um, and I have been able to have a lot of these things that are just much more difficult to, to have outside of a fence, like the day lilies and the uh, oriental lilies. To name and the hosta, well, they're not inside that fence. I have to spray them. But I have begun to use the smaller, this is uh, pond and pool netting, actually. It's, but it's the same kind of thing, okay? And I have been using some of this to cover some small areas because unless you're right on top of it, you don't see it. Now, I have had to be careful with how I use this because I also have hummingbirds. And I am really enjoying those hummingbirds. But I don't want to use this in such a way. This is a smaller netting thing. I don't want to use it in such a way around the pollinator things that those hummingbirds might get caught in it. So just think about that a little bit. They don't get caught in that larger deer fencing because it's a heavier duty netting and larger spaces. I don't have to worry about that particular thing. But I encourage you to, to get out into the garden. It's supposed to be a little cooler coming up and hopefully we'll get some rain soon. But now's the time to do this if you want success. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of people come in three weeks from now and they want these plants and it's getting late and, and we don't always have them. They need time to mature. And so you really need to get out there and, uh, and, and do your thing. And, and when you go out there, I, I mentioned products again that I absolutely have to have. And fortunately, we are still carrying here at the Fair Oaks location, these fox gloves. And I absolutely love them. Gentlemen, uh, you might buy the large size, it might fit you, but I don't know about that. Um, wonderful, wonderful. They can be washed. I feel, I can feel easily that you can't necessarily do with other gloves. I've worn them for years. And if you're working with something really wet, I know that you can buy a box of these disposable gloves and, and I will, and then still, because they fit so snugly, you can still feel. I like to feel it. But I'm not one that wants my hands and fingernails and everything else down in the soil all the time okay i love the feel of the soil but i want my hands to be covered when i'm working in it sally do we have any questions we do um just want to encourage everybody to start sending your questions in and just gonna let everybody know things are a little different today if i if we're not able to get to your questions today you are welcome to email me but at some point starting this afternoon you're going to get an away message directing you to our colleague uh daniel cap who is sitting in the room with peg right now so he will right. <laughs> there he is yeah i'm gonna be leaving town i'll be out for um through the end of next week but he will be happy to assist you so uh just a heads up there um all right, you addressed part of this, but I want to get into a little bit more detail because we have a couple questions on it. Is it too late to plant fall vegetable seeds? Um, so is it better to start indoors and replant outdoors or can you directly sow the seeds outside? So I know you addressed 
some of the plants that it's too late to start by seed? Because uh, the ones the that that I have a little bit of concern for from seed are those that form heads like cabbage and broccoli and Brussels sprouts. Now, for fun, because we never know what the weather's going to do, you certainly can give it a try. But I know that right now is a great time to do the mustard greens. See, they don't head and they grow quickly. Collards, which I absolutely love. We've had several people here at the, at the garden center talking about collards and their different methods of cooking. So I think we need a collards cook-off here. See who's best. Kale, different varieties of kale, great. Yeah, but here's the Russian kale, Siberian kale, southern mustard, uh, all kinds of lettuce, um, all of those things that don't form heads will still be fine growing. And they'll go through like frost. They love the cool weather. And I highly recommend that. And I highly recommend having some of that frost block on hand because if in late October or early November, you get a uh, frost, a heavy frost freeze, you can always cover them and, and maybe take them a lot longer. And, and by the way, you, this is a great time to plant garlic. It's a great time to plant the onion sets too. I love to do the onion sets because as I mentioned earlier, I love to use the greens in cooking as well as the roots. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Quick question on our uh, container planted vegetables. So as the weather starts to cool, do people need to do anything to protect? Like, do they need to wrap their containers and insulate them at all? Or, or um, for vegetables, can you get away with the harvest guard cloth? Where your containers are concerned, it depends upon the type of container. These, a lot of the ones that I have out in the vegetable garden are composite and I don't worry about them. The one thing that you, if you are leaving containers out, which I have many that I leave out with vegetables and other things in them, you never want them sitting directly on soil. You want them slightly raised off the soil so that that container isn't absorbing that moisture and is more likely to crack, okay? Um, you want to be sure that it's, it's on concrete or when you're wood decking, don't ever leave a container sitting directly on your wood deck. I have done that and regretted it, okay? So anytime you have containers, out on your deck, raise them off it so that the air goes underneath, okay? So okay. as far as that's concerned, now, if really, you know, our winters vary. I don't normally cover any of my containers except one, which I had thought that I had in this series, but maybe not. Maybe I, it's that's going to be covered on Saturday. I have a huge container. It must be Saturdays that I was seeing the pictures of it. I have a huge uh, terracotta container with a gorgeous big Japanese maple in it. I will often, because I absolutely, it's the last container of that size that I could ever get, and I certainly don't want it to break. It's been there for several years now. I will often put bubble wrap, I save my bubble wrap, and I, not over where the water goes, but around all the edges to give it some protection. Plus, I'm a little protected. I've got big trees around, okay? I will put that bubble wrap and wrap it on, and then to make it more attractive, I will wrap on a layer of burlap because it's attractive and tie it on firmly. Now I've got a little insulation around that big pot that I absolutely don't want to break. So if you've got some bigger pots and you've got a very exposed area and you want to be sure that they don't crack, that's a good way to do it. And the, the bubble wrap is good because it's very insulating, okay? 
that's that's where I go with it. Okay, that yeah, that's all great. And sorry if you guys heard my phone ringing. I was trying to get it on uh, Do Not Disturb It. It rings to my computer, so I can't turn it off. Um, all righty, next question. When growing from seed, how close can I place the lettuce or the mezclun seeds? Um, I'm using a raised bed containers. Okay, so they're trying to see how much lettuce they can plant in one place. Okay, it doesn't matter whether it's a raised bed or a container or whatever. Um, lettuce seeds are quite small, so you're definitely going to get them a little too thick. And and this, they're probably all germinate. So as thinly as you can around, okay, and you can you can do some and skip a space and do some and skip a space or just do around the edges. Here's what you can do also is let them come up and begin to grow. And you can snip a small bunch and use them as little baby greens until they're on up a little taller. And then you can thin them a little more heavily, okay? So I like to always plant a little thicker than you really want it to grow. And rather than pulling those up and disturbing all those roots, I prefer to cut them. And that's where my little Joyce Chin scissors come in that I've had for many years. Um, quick definition uh, that that I have been taking for granted and realized we're getting we've got a question about it. When you discuss, you talk about vegetables that form heads. Can yes. you describe what that means? Yes, I certainly will be happy to. You love to buy cabbage, at least I do, you know, love coleslaw. Um, cabbage forms a head. Now, envision that head in the grocery store. Broccoli forms a head. And you see that head in the grocery store. And a lot of times when you clip that biggest first head, with your George chins, it will send out small shoots from the side, and then you'll have small heads. Where Brussels sprouts are concerned, I have not grown Brussels sprouts, but David Yost has, and had really good look, luck a couple of years ago on his deck. And he grew them, and they form, picture in the grocery store, little Brussels sprouts all along the stem. And they form, and as the stem gets taller, they continue to form. And he was thrilled because he it grew all winter on a day. So when I speak of the greens, that you are growing to form a head, that's what I mean. If you are growing collards, turnips, mustard, lettuce, those things, they are the leaves that you're eating, not the head, okay? Perfect. Thank you. I was trying to think of how to describe it and we could not have come up with a good, a good of an explanation. So um, quick question for you is uh, for people who want to plant garlic. I know we have a blog post on it that I did with David a couple years ago. Is now the time to plant garlic or do you wait a little longer for that? Uh, if you, I'm not sure whether our garlic has come in. Okay. Yet. I didn't check before this. I should have. But as soon as it's in the store, go ahead and plant it. Gotcha. Okay. And it tells you how to do that. You know, you pull the little pieces apart and plant them at least two inches deep. And um, the fun thing about garlic that you have to understand is once you planted it, it's going to begin to grow its roots. And then usually mine here in very, very early spring or late winter, actually, begins to send up the green foliage, okay? So it's got to grow, it's got to form this green foliage, and then have that mature 
which takes several months, turn yellow, and that's when it's ready to dig. Use the garlic and be sure you replant a few to, to start the process over. Now, one of the things that I enjoy with my garlic is when it over winter, late winter, when those green stems come up, leaves, it's it's not round like uh, onions, okay? It's a flat stem, but it's long. I love to take pieces of that and I can rub a salad though with it and it just gives it enough of that garlic flavor to be pleasing. You can also use it in soups or stir fries or whatever. So in addition to the bulbs, that foliage is wonderful to cook with also. Already? Yes, it is. Um, okay, here's a question for people who are new to growing vegetables in containers. Um, do you have any plants for the fall season that you would recommend for a beginner container vegetable gardener? What are some of the easiest plants to have success with if you're starting out? The ones that I just talked about. Okay. Those are the ones that are available. Okay. It, for novices, okay. Uh, the warm season things are finished, so to speak. What you're doing now are the greens. Those are the winter the fall and winter vegetables. So like the lettuces and all, all of All of those, and it couldn't be easier. And I do my containers. I put my little piece of uh, felt in the bottom, put in really good potting soil. Mary Fields potting soil is excellent. I'm very much into the foxglove, which again has the lobster and so uh, seafood compost in it. I like it. Always, if you're a newbie, hold that soil down from the top of the container. Don't ever fill your containers all the way to the top. If you do, it's extremely difficult to water them. And get these things started. Start from plants. You can start from seeds too, but only the ones that I mentioned. Go ahead and get them started. You'll need to check your watering regularly, but when I get into October, it is rare that I water anything. Usually we get enough rain. Things have cooled down. They're not using as much water. And I don't normally water my containers in the wintertime. Not even that big Japanese maypole or any of the other things that I have. I've never lost one, knock on wood. Now, if we have a tremendously dry winter, that might make a difference. Or if I needed to go out in October and water um, a newly planted evergreen, you, you've got to check on it. You've got to look at the weather to see what it's doing. But generally speaking, maintenance on containers as it gets deeper into the season is much less. So if you are a novice, do it. You're going to learn by doing. Yeah, I'm looking forward to planting my lettuce. It's so pretty and I have to plant my vegetables by my front door. So I don't feel bad planting lettuce <laughs> um, for my neighbors. Um, all right. Well, we're close to the end and we do have David's plant clinic coming up at two. So we do need to wrap it up. Um, again, just reminding everybody, I will be leaving town. I'll be unavailable starting later this afternoon. But you can, if you do email me, you'll get uh, Danny's contact information and you can reach out to him. Um, I will be sending out probably the coupon this afternoon to make sure everybody gets it. The recording takes, it could take a few hours to actually get it ready. Um, so you'll probably have to contact again, Danny, if you want that recording, which I do apologize for that. Uh, usually when I leave town, I, I'm available to check in and send you guys emails, but Danny, I will not be this time. Danny's good. on. <laughs> um, yeah, so, come over yeah. here and say hello. Yeah, come over and say hello. Danny. A lot of you guys know him. He gets uh -huh. me. <laughs> this is Danny. You. Um, <laughs> he's our guest. Um, so a few announcements for you all. Um, Danny will be hosting next week's webinar with Mary Kirk as well. So he'll be taking my place then. Um, Peg has her container gardens class this Saturday at 10 a.m. at the Fair Oak store. It is a great class. If you can attend that, I would highly recommend it. Um, 
Peg, do you uh, want to say anything about that class before we wrap up? Or oh, I totally, totally enjoy it. I'll talk to you about diversity and pollinators and some of the fun things that you can do. So, yes, I encourage you all to come. Definitely. All right. Well, for anybody who wants to attend the plant clinic, I will be on that. If you have not signed up for it and you want to attend, it's on lawn care. So if you're a lawn person, uh, this will be a good class for you. Just send me a quick note. I'll try and get you the link. Um, otherwise, if you have any questions, just send me or Danny an email. We will get to you. Um, if not me, then him. And uh, keep an eye out for your email with your with your class coupon. And thank you all so much, and especially for your patience while I'm out, just that we're going to have a little bit of a different kind of schedule until I get back. So, um, Peg, thank you so much. I learned so much on your classes every time. <laughs> I'm excited to plant my vegetables now. Um, all righty. Well, thank you, everybody. And we'll see some of you all at two. And hopefully, Peg will see some of you all on Saturday. Saturday. I'd love it. Thank you. All righty. Bye, Peg. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>